So we're here at Scarborough Bray, on the west coast of mainland Orkney. This is one of the most impressive sites apparently in the whole of Scotland. And it's very much like a influence, most certainly from the Nap of Hawa on Papa Westray. Now we know that there's many hearths here, there's homes, there's settlements. It almost looks like a kind of um, hobbit village. And it was even mentioned in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull movie in one of uh, Indiana Jones's lectures. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting site. A lot of work's been done on this with people like Laird Scranton and others. So let's get in there and take a closer look. So you can just see behind me here, this is the main, the most famous part of Scarborough Bray. This is called House One. And you can see behind me is what looks like some kind of cupboard space or a wardrobe where you fold your clothes up or put your plates and your knives and forks. And then there's, uh, looks like various household implements, uh, grinding stones, um, even bed areas, a hearth, which is like where you'd light your fire. And there would be like a wooden roof over the top of this, I would imagine. And uh, it really is a beautiful and very strange little site. Um, now, the influence really comes from Papa Westray, from the Nap of Hawa. That was, that was there at least two or three hundred years earlier than Scarra Bray. But more work needs to be done here because there's no, I haven't looked at any of the geometry or astronomy yet because I'm sure there's stuff going on here when you look at some of the alignments coming out from some of these chambers, which could have been houses, of course, but I think some of them may have been ceremonial. And when you've got the beautiful beach here, look, right next to you, you know, there's a good reason why you'd want to live somewhere like this on the west coast of Orkney. So this really is an example of planned living. There's clearly, this is organized, going back to about, well, 3000 BC or a bit less down into house one and these look like potentially two little bedrooms then we have the hearth there and other things here like the dresser various different things and then we have very small doorways which probably just to keep it warm with extremely thick walls would uh, maintain that and it's pretty tall as well but you can see the thin stones like the orthostats or the partitions this is what has just been discovered on the Nessa Brodgar in a trench T and so we have the same kind of thing going on here and at the Nessa Brodgar and at the Nap of Hawa on Papa Westering. And you can just see here more examples of these thin slabs that make up this particular house, which is number two, apparently. Um, this is just an intriguing place to live. Imagine living here. I'm sure there'd be sheepskins and many other things all around here to make it more comfortable and warm. We're gonna have a look inside the reconstructed house so we get more of an idea of what it was really like. So this one is house five. And there's a sign here that says, shows this beautiful grooved ware pottery that was found. So this is very interesting. We just zoomed in on this. It looks like some kind of chevron or 
part of a diamond carved onto this orthostat or this partition stone, as well as a whole stone. Now, is that deliberate? Is this potentially evidence of a tradition that stretches back to the time of Gebekli Tepe, where it's a carved soul hole, as Andrew Collins calls it? Uh, or is it just a convenient thing a pole will go through to maybe hold things up? But that chevron on there is very intriguing. I wonder if that's natural or if it's actually one of the carvings that was actually noted and discovered here at Scarra Bray. So this is the workshop. So this is interesting because this is where they probably made the famous stone balls and the different strange carved tools and no bedding or anything like that in it. So it was most probably that. It's also got thicker walls, partly because um, they were not dug into the midden for support. So there's more stone in the walls here. So it's interesting that, you know, there are different rooms to do different things. It's all just not done in the same place. To get an idea of how the ancients really lived, this is a really good site to kind of get a sense of that. So just behind me, there's a covered up house. They deliberately covered this up because it has some of the most important carvings discovered on the whole of Orkney. Now, this is house seven, and there were some beautiful lines and diamonds and zigzags carved onto one of the kind of partitions or orthostats. And because of the temperature changes and things like this, they were gonna get damaged. So they covered it back up to preserve it for future generations. But when we go into the recreation of the houses, it's actually got it on display in there. So we can see exactly what it looks like. So this just shows you an image of what the carvings look like. And this is the spot they were found in house seven. And so these were actually carved on to one of the orthostats or the, the, par the partition, the megalithic partitions. And we must realize that one of these or several of these have just been found on the nest of Brodgar. So when more digging takes place, I'd be absolutely intrigued if this was some kind of mark, marking system for a calendar or something else. And this is the area that they were actually discovered in, house number seven. But we're finding the same kind of carvings as we see in other parts of Orkney, obviously, but potentially other parts of the world. This is something Laird Scranton and others have been looking at, suggesting there could be international connections with this particular uh, part of the world. And it does make sense because we're right next to the sea. Uh, we know they were a seafaring nation, the ancient megalithic peoples. We also know they were using the megalithic yard. Now this has been evidenced and proven by Alexander Tom at you know, some of the monuments in Orkney, but also by Nicholas Cope at the Knapp of Hawa of Papa Westray. So whether they were using it here would be fascinating to know. I'm gonna look, look into this because it seems like it's a tradition that maintained itself. And I'm absolutely sure they were using different variations of the liberal arts, the geometry, the metrology, the astronomy and so forth to kind of create this agricultural megalithic society, which potentially spreads south from here. And this is evidenced in the grooved ware pottery. It's evidenced um, in the stone spheres that kind of may have originated here and then spread to Aberdeenshire and other areas, even right down to Bridlington near the Rudston monolith and the gypsy race. And so we have big question marks here because we know they were, they were making stone spheres here. We know they have intricate carvings. We know this is very much in the style of uh, the Knapp of Hawa, which is um, on Papa West Ray. And we also know that thanks to Laird Scranton that there are potential connections with Egypt with this particular site. So we're just inside the reconstruction of Skara Bray here at the site, next to the visitor center. And you can just see how they would have lived. You get a real sense of it in here with the roof. You can see that above me, you know, with the wood and the, probably the sheepskin and things like that. Then you've got the sheepskin rugs for the bed. And then you've got the hearth at the back. Although the top shelf of the dresser was found to be bare, there were on the lower shelf there were pieces of pottery and burnt bones like we have on display here 
and there was a pit in front of the dresser that contained excrement which is uh, probably this one down here so whether that was the the public toilet on the bottom right there we don't know then we have these box beds here um, then you have a kind of fireside slab and one of the beds obviously has carvings on it and it's these ones here which are really quite remarkable really um, and it was almost as if this you know people would climb in and out of this rather than actually you know just roll in and out of bed like we do today there's also a decorated pot it was also found in one of the beds i can't see it in here right now but these look like these were some kind of sinks or toilets the original door was apparently half the height of this and it was only later that the upper part was forced through by people living in the house after it partially filled up with sand, probably a few hundred years later. So behind one of the beds, either this one or this one here, there were actually two skeletons of women were found buried partly under the house wall behind one of the beds. So I find that particularly interesting. So the roof obviously is not made of anything like it was then as it's made of fiberglass, but you can see no doubt it would have been some kind of sheepskin with wood, that kind of thing. So yes, an absolutely fascinating sight that being so old, being like 3000 BC or 2600 BC to 3000 BC, it's really quite amazing what was found here and these carvings really do get me there were other ones that looked like diamonds as well which will show images of here and chevrons which we potentially saw at the site but overall scara bray is very interesting i think what's really interesting is the work Laird Scranton's doing on Scarborough Bray. He's done a fantastic book about it. And he's looked into all the different aspects, linking it with Dogon cosmology, the Egyptians and other such things. And there is evidence now that ancient diffusionism was a reality. So Scarborough Bray and Orkney could well have been part of that. And I'm coming to the conclusion in my research that the, the megalithic yard and many other things like the stone balls, the megalithic construction spread around the world, potentially from this area. There's even evidence in South America in uh, around Lake Titicaca where a stone ball has been discovered, uh, which is a geometric six-sided shape. So we really do need to ask the question about diffusionism and whether Orkney was one of the most important, probably the original site of many of the cultures we find around the world. So I'm absolutely convinced they went across the Atlantic to North America, where they were involved in the construction of the megalithic sites all over New England and New York State. And they probably made their way down and they've even found the bog mummies in Florida, which were red haired, Caucasian, and they were like potentially from Europe. The DNA suggests that, and that goes back about 8,000 years. Uh, we also have further down at the entrance to the Amazon in Brazil, a great stone circle there, Brazilian Stonehenge they call it, which has got the same kind of geometry as we find in some of the Scottish stone circles. And all the way down the Amazon, in all the different countries there, there's these great earthworks and also supposedly fair-skinned red hair and blonde haired tribes that have been there for thousands of years that were witnessed by various explorers. Um, as well as the great geoglyphs in that area as well, which do suggest um, there could be a connection because some of the geoglyphs are of the same shape as the earthworks and stone circles in Scotland, which has been discovered by Alexander Tom. There's even one that looks like a flattened B stone circle shape. And then you get to the area of Lake Titicaca, which you can make your way through there. And we find what looks like a six sided or six protrusions on it, a Scottish stone sphere. And even some of the the carvings of the people at Tiwanaku do not look at all South American. They look like they're from Britain. So there's some really interesting connections that various researchers and myself are starting to put together. And I think Scarra Bray, uh, the Nessa Brodgar, and um, all these sites on Orkney and Aberdeenshire was like the hub, potentially, where it all began. Mm -hmm.